We live from New Delhi. You're watching the India News on India's Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Kurana coming up in the next hour. Iran says it wouldn't need to retaliate if United Nations had condemned strike on Damascus. Asserts it won't be hasty. U.S. speaks to Turkey, China, Saudi Arabia on avoiding escalation in West Asia. Israel says prepared and on high alert. Major Russian airstrikes destroy Ukraine's energy system. Putin says how to attack in response to Kyiv strikes. IAEA chief says Zaporizhia attacks risk shift in Ukraine conflict. Attacking a nuclear power plant, ladies and gentlemen, is an absolute no-go. And O.G. Simpson, the controversial American sports figure, dies of cancer at 76. Football star was acquitted of killing his former wife and a friend in a 1995 case dubbed as the trial of the century. Also, India makes a return to the Cannes Film Festival after 30 years. Pile Kabadia's movie, All We Imagine as Light, to premiere at the competition section. Well, on to the details now as tensions in West Asia escalates, Tehran's envoy to the UN claims that if the UN Security Council had denounced the attack, the imperative for Iran to retaliate for it on its diplomatic compound in Damascus may have been averted. Though Iran has signaled to Washington that it will not act impulsively in response to Israel's attack on its Syrian embassy, Iran will instead attempt to prevent a significant escalation as Tehran presses demands, including a Gaza truce. Reportedly, Iran's message to Washington was conveyed by Iranian foreign minister during a visit on Sunday to the Gulf Arab state of Oman, which has often acted as an intermediary between Tehran and Washington. The diplomatic messaging points to a conscious approach by Iran as it weighs how to respond to the 1st of April attack in a way that deters Israel from further such actions, but avoids a military escalation that could suck in the United States. Meanwhile, Israel said it has been bracing for possible Iranian retaliation for the killing of a senior general and six other Iranian officers in an airstrike in Damascus on the 1st of April. We are prepared both defensively and offensively in a variety of capacities of the army. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has engaged in talks with his Turkish, Chinese and Saudi Arabian counterparts amid concerns that Iran will strike Israel in retaliation for a strike in Damascus. During the talks, the U.S. has expressed his concern towards the tensions in West Asia and made clear that escalation in the region is not in anyone's interest. I don't have any calls to announce, but we have been engaged in a series of, of contacts, not just at his level, but at other levels, too, to talk to foreign okay. counterparts to send this very clear message to Iran that they should not escalate this conflict. We continue to be concerned about the risk of escalation in the Middle East, uh, something we have been working to mitigate and contain since the attacks of October 7th, uh, and specifically about the threats made in recent days by Iran against the state of Israel and the Israeli people. While White House affirmed the U.S. had in clad commitment to Israel's security and asserted that U.S. was not involved in the Damascus strike. We've been very clear about that. And uh, we've been very clear uh, that, uh, in, in, you know, to Iran that we're not involved in the Damascus strike, right? We've been also very clear. I'm not going to get into public back and forth. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike. 
While killing a farmer's leader, Ismail Haneye's sons on Wednesday has risked complicating efforts to free hostages still in Gaza. Although Hamas clarified that they keep interest of the Palestinian people ahead of everything, meanwhile, Israel is adding new crossing points to boost the delivery of aid brought in overland from Jordan to Israel's east. Alex Cardia tells us more from Tel Aviv. Well, that strike which killed uh, three sons of Ismail Haniyeh, the uh, Hamas political leader, was uh, decided on without consulting the Prime Minister, the Defence Minister or senior IDF commanders. In fact, the decision was strike, uh, to strike was made on the ground level by field commanders. We understand they see, saw it as a tactical decision based on intelligence by Shin Bet, the security agency. They say the three men were going to uh, conduct acts of terror in central Gaza. No details on what those acts would have been. No response on the allegations that four of Ismail Haniyeh's grandchildren were also killed in the strike. Now, Ismail Haniyeh has said that uh, Israel is delusional if it thinks that targeting his sons uh, will uh, soften Hamas's position in those tense and ongoing ceasefire negotiations. Clearly still more work to be done there to reach a deal, but also more work to be done on the humanitarian front. The UN Security Council acknowledging that Israel has made some efforts when it comes to allowing more aid into the Gaza Strip, but saying a lot more still needs to be done. We know from Prime Minister Netanyahu, he said the port of Ashdod would be open to humanitarian supplies and the areas checkpoint in the north of the Gaza Strip would also be opened. We don't know yet if either of those things have happened. We've seen an increase in the number of trucks going in, but aid agencies say those trucks aren't full and therefore the amount of aid and food and medical supplies that are needed in Gaza still not getting to those who so desperately need it. So some progress on that aid situation, but not nearly enough. Some movement on the ceasefire talks, but no deal yet. Alex Kadia in Tel Aviv reporting for DD India. And updates now on Russia-Ukraine conflict. Russian missiles and drones destroyed a large electricity plant near Kyiv and hit power facilities in several regions of Ukraine on Thursday. A senior official at the company said the major attack completely destroyed the triple scar coal-powered thermal power plant near the capital. The substations and power generating facilities had been damaged in attacks on the regions of Odessa, Kharkiv, Zaporozhye, Lviv and Kyiv. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin said Russia had been obliged to launch strikes in response to Kyiv's attacks on Russian targets. Unfortunately, we observed a series of strikes on our energy sites recently and were obliged to respond. I want to emphasize that, even for humanitarian reasons, we did not carry out any strikes in winter. What I mean is that we didn't want to leave social institutions without power, hospitals and the like. But after a series of attacks on our power facilities, we had to respond. Well, the UN nuclear watchdog chief Rafael Grossi said direct attacks against Zaporozhye nuclear power plant marked a major escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers in Ukraine. Speaking at the special meeting of the agency's 35-nation board of governors on Thursday, Grossi called for maximum restraint to prevent a nuclear accident and ensure the integrity of the ZNPP. He said Sunday's attack fortunately did not compromise nuclear safety in a serious way, but it would be irresponsible for us to assume future attacks will also not. On Sunday, direct attacks against the Saporizhia nuclear power plant marked a major escalation of the nuclear safety and security dangers in Ukraine, significantly increasing the risk of a nuclear accident. The most recent attacks, however, are a clear violation of the principles and have shifted us into an acutely consequential juncture in this war. Well, UN chief will meet with the UN Security Council next week. And moving on, Ukraine takes action to deal with the acute soldier shortage as its conflict with Russia grinds into its third year. Parliament passed a legislation on Thursday to simplify conscription 
aiding an expected mobilization that could press hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian men into the battlefield. Ukraine has been suffering setbacks on the battlefield against Russia, a country with three times its population. The new measures should increase troop numbers by requiring men to update their draft data with authorities, boosting payments to those who volunteer and letting some convicts serve. The bill requires President Zelensky's signature to become the law. And Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has also expressed concern of a deteriorating situation in Ukraine, saying Kyiv risks collapsing under Russia's offensive without U.S. support. Addressing the joint meeting of the U.S. Congress, Kishida warned about North Korea's nuclear program and exports of missiles supporting Russia's war in Ukraine. He asserted that Ukraine of today may be East Asia of tomorrow. Russia's unprovoked, unjust, and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine has entered its third year. As I often say, Ukraine of today may be East Asia of tomorrow. <laughs> the leadership of the United States it is indispensable. Without U.S. support, how long before hopes of Ukraine would collapse under the onslaught from Moscow? Well, Japan's Kishida addresses the U.S. Congress after U.S. President Joe Biden hosted him and Philippines President for a trilateral. Long simmering tensions between China and its neighbors took center stage at the meet, where three leaders pushed back on Beijing, stepped up pressure on Manila in the disputed South China Sea. The United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I've said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. We seek to identify ways of growing our economies and making them more resilient, climate-proofing our, our cities and our societies, sustaining our development progress, and forging a peaceful world, world for the next generation. In order to secure peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific, I hope to reaffirm our intention to further strengthen trilateral cooperation and to present the specific way forward through today's meeting. And still to come on DD India News Hour. In a bid to provide a boost to economic growth in Peru, Congress approved a controversial proposal that will allow retirees to tap saving accounts. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris to visit Arizona today. The state ruling puts abortion at center of 2024 presidential election. And scientists testing a robot named a spirit to walk on the moon. Regional parties call the shots in the Northeast. Will local issues play high? over national issues. What are the issues that matter in Mizoram, Nagaland, Tripura and Manipur? On the Great Indian Election on Friday at 8.30 p.m. IST and 1500 hours GMT only on DD India. Jaipur.
regional parties call the shots in the northeast will local issues play high over national issues what are the issues that matter in mizoram nagaland tripura and manipur on the great indian election on friday at 8:30 pm ist and 1500 hours gmt only on dd india Welcome back you're watching DD India News I'm Lepak Shikran and moving on Peru's Congress approved a controversial proposal that will allow retirees to tap saving accounts that the country's financial regulator estimated could force pension fund administrators to sell some 7 billion dollars in assets the bill was passed with 96 votes in favor five against and five abstentions over the past four years lawmakers have approved six previous pension fund withdrawals worth some 24 billion dollars in a bid to provide a boost to cash strapped to savers at a time of sluggish economic growth in peru once one of south america's star performers retirees with pension funds in peru represent a minority minority however as about 7 out of 10 workers in the country are employed in the informal economy and do not contribute to retirement accounts pension fund administrators nonetheless invest around 60% of the savings they manage in local assets mostly in government bonds Well cases and deaths from the dengue epidemic in Peru have more than tripled in 2024. The number of deaths from dengue fever and suspected cases rose to 117 on the 13th week this year. The authorities have approved an emergency decree with extraordinary economic measures to strengthen the strategy against the epidemic. The figures in Peru are alarming because the ability of the transmitting mosquitoes rose in reaching regions where dengue had not been detected before. Well, US Vice President Kamala Harris will visit Arizona today just days after the state's top court reinstated a law from 1864 criminalizing and banning abortions in nearly all circumstances abortion has become a central issue in the 2024 elections and as Tony Waterman explains the Biden administration is wasting no time in politically capitalizing on this latest extreme ban and laying the blame at Donald Trump's feet This trip to Arizona wasn't even on the vice president's schedule late last week and now it is an official campaign event headlined as a fight for reproductive freedoms. Kamala Harris is visiting Tucson, which is Arizona's second largest city, and while there, she is expected to blast this state Supreme Court decision and blame former president Donald Trump, who appointed the conservative justices to the US Supreme Court that overturned Roe v. Wade 2 years ago turning abortion access to the states. This 160-year-old law in Arizona, which existed before women had the right to vote and before Arizona was even a state, will be one of the most extreme abortion laws when it is reinstated in about 2 weeks. Doctors will face up to 5 years in prison if they perform an abortion. The only exception is to save the life of the mother, but there are no clear guidelines on what constitutes a medical emergency. And in other states with similar bans, doctors have refused to perform the procedure for fear of breaking the law and in some cases that has jeopardized the lives of women. Friday's trip to Arizona will be Harris's second in the span of a month which is an indication of just how important this state is going to be in the 2024 elections. Out of all the battleground states, Joe Biden won Arizona by the thinnest margin in 2020 and current polls show him trailing behind his Republican rival Donald Trump. Polls though also show that abortion is a top issue for voters, the vast majority of which support abortion access. So Democrats are hoping that this latest ban will galvanize voters and Kamala Harris's trip is all about doing just that. Tony Waterman in Austin, Texas reporting for DD India. Well, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is concerned about the possibility of an organized attack in the United States similar to the one that killed a scores of people at a Russian concert hall last month. FBI director told the House of Representatives panel on Thursday that the attack might be carried out by an individual or small group inspired by the conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. 
The March 22nd attack on a concert hall in a Moscow suburb killed at least 144 people, the deadliest in Russia in 20 years. A branch of the Islamic State terrorist group claimed a responsibility, but Russian President Vladimir Putin, without citing evidence, has sought to blame Ukraine. And Russian military instructors arrived in Jujue on Wednesday in a plane loaded with military equipment. The arrival comes as per an agreement between the junta and Russian President Vladimir Putin to boost cooperation. Also, according to which Russia had agreed to install an anti-aircraft system in Niger. Since a July 2023 coup, the military junta that seized power in Niamey has kicked out French and European forces and quit the economic community of West African states regional bloc. Like Huntas in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso, it has also strengthened military ties with Russia. And Russia and Kazakhstan continue to battle record floods as rivers rise further. The village of Kamenskoye in Russia's Kurgan region was being evacuated on Friday morning after the water level there rose 4.59 feet overnight. Kamenskoye is a settlement along with the Tobol River, which also flows through the regional center Kurgan, a city of 300,000 people. Shamko said a deluge could reach Kurgan in the coming days. Well, similar scenes are being witnessed across northern Kazakhstan also. A state of emergency remained in effect in eight affected regions of the country. Emergency workers have so far removed 8.8 .8 million cubic meters of water from flooded areas. The deluge of meltwater has forced over 120,000 people from their homes in Russia's Ural Mountains, Siberia, and Kazakhstan. Well, wildfires have ravaged parts of Villa Nova in Guatemala, prompting the government to declare a natural disaster. According to the reports, dozens of fires are burning in forest areas and a major landfill site in the Villa Nova area. Guatemala officials report over 200 people have sought medical attention after exposure to smoke from the burning landfill. President Bernardo Arevelo has said the vast majority of the fires are man-made. And in Florida, the storms brought down more than 10 inches of rain in parts of Tallahassee, prompting flash floods on roadways and the rescue of stranded people. Eyewitnesses video showed a road washed out after two fierce storms hit Tallahassee, Florida on Wednesday and Thursday. Some districts in the affected areas directed to close schools and urged people to avoid the flooded roads. And a trail of destruction was seen in many parts of the United States after a devastating tornado battered the region. Tornado damaged the buildings, vehicles and tried after a tornado hit Lucenia and Alabama. Locals encountered a widespread damage when the tornado struck on that littered road with buildings' roofs partially ripped off, leaving more than 100,000 of residents without power. We will provide more updates as time comes. Along with and in India, Prime Minister Narendra Modi chaired a meeting to review preparedness for the ensuing heat wave season. Prime Minister was briefed about the temperature outlook for the period from April to June 2024, including the forecast for the upcoming hot weather season, the likelihood of above normal maximum temperatures over most parts of the country, especially with high probability over central India and western peninsula India. Preparedness in the health sector was also reviewed. Prime Minister stressed upon the whole of government approach. He said that all arms of the government at central, state and district levels and various ministries need to work on this in synergy. Prime Minister also stressed upon awareness creation along with adequate preparedness in hospitals. He also highlighted the need for quick detection and putting out the forest fires.
And the controversial American sports figure O.G. Simpson has died of cancer at the age of 76. Simpson rose to fame on the football field and remained in the spotlight when he was accused of murdering his ex-wife and another man in 1994. Ira Spitzer reports from Simpson's hometown of San Francisco for more. O.J. Simpson had a standout career as a running back in the National Football League from 1969 to 1979, followed by a successful foray into acting. However, he is best known for accusations that he stabbed and killed his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman in 1994 at her Los Angeles home. After Simpson was charged with the murders, he led police on a long, low-speed car chase around L.A. in a vehicle driven by his friend that was watched on TV by tens of millions of people at the time. Simpson was acquitted of the murder charges in a blockbuster, televised criminal trial the next year. The differing reactions to the verdict between black and white Americans at the time exposed racial fault lines in American society. The trial took place in L.A. with a majority black jury just a few years after white police officers were found not guilty in the beating of black man Rodney King, which led to the L.A. riots. Simpson was, however, found liable for the wrongful deaths of his ex-wife and Ron Goldman in a civil trial just a few years later. Ultimately, Simpson would serve almost nine years in prison after he was convicted of armed robbery in a separate incident in Las Vegas in the early 2000s. Reporting in San Francisco, Ira Spitzer for DD India. And now let's take a look at other stories making news around the world. In Ecuador, supporters and opponents of former Ecuadorian Vice President George Glass convened outside the National Justice Court as a judge deliberated on a habeas corpus request for Glass. If approved, this legal recourse could secure Glass's release following his detention in a raid on the Mexican embassy last week, where he has resided since December. As of Thursday night, the judge had not yet reached a decision in the corruption case. Aviation company Boeing says that the embattled airplane manufacturer is focusing on rebuilding trust after a series of safety incidents have shaken trust of the company and led CEO Dave Calhoun to announce he would step down by the year end. The executive said that Boeing worked closely with the airline and Australian government after a flight suffered a sudden mid-air dive and injured 50 people. Scientists are testing a robot named Spirit to walk on the moon, preparing the robot to walk and monitor the extreme conditions of the moon and Mars for future mission to the space. The idea is to teach Spirit how to cope with difficult and changing terrains in the same way as humans do, such as walking from hardy or rocky surfaces to soft ground like snow or sand. Exhibition opens in Turkmenistan showcasing artistry that highlights its legacy of culture. The exhibition includes more than 250 art pieces, including paintings, sculptures, jewelry and many more. These works of art poetically glorify the beauty of our happy times, our traditions associated with the arrival of the spring holidays. And still to come on DD India News Hour. Election fever grips India, campaigning in full swing across the country. Notification for third phase to begin today. Indian Army conducted a training exercise of anti tank guided missile firing at a super high altitude area in Sikkim. And India celebrates fourth day of Navaratri, devotees offering prayers to seek blessings of the divine power.
biggest Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Voting is our responsibility. This is a big fight between uh, BJP and uh, India alliance. Will you vote? Ah, vote. We are power of democracy. This is a huge. BJP is trying her best, you know, for the past 10 years under the flagship of uh, Sri Narendra Modi Gadu. The 2024 Lok Sabha polls in Tamil Nadu are witnessing the battle royale between DMK, AIA DMK, and the BJP. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lepakshi Kurana and time now for a quick recap of the headlines. Iran says it wouldn't need to retaliate if United Nations had condemned a strike on Damascus, asserts it won't be hasty. US speaks to Turkey, China, Saudi Arabia on avoiding escalation in West Asia. Israel says prepared and on high alert. Major Russian airstrikes destroy Ukraine's energy system. Putin says had to attack in response to Kyiv strikes. IAEA chief says Zaporizhia attack risk a shift in Ukraine conflict. India makes a return to the Cannes Film Festival after 30 years. Pile Kabaria's movie All We Imagine as Light to premiere at the competition section. And moving on, Prime Minister Narendra Modi spoke about various subjects pertaining to India's development and the upcoming elections in an interview with an Indian daily newspaper, Hindustan Times. PM Modi said, and I quote, he is committed to taking strict actions against the corrupt. Steps are being taken even in states where BJP is in power. He said that elections are the biggest festival of democracy in India. He further added that even opposition believes that NDA will return to power. Slamming Congress, PM Modi said, under BJP model, the priority is to strengthen the country in contrast to Congress model that focused on strengthening their family. He said that 25 crore people have come out of poverty and over 4 crore people have their own houses. He further said that this is just a trailer, lot more work has to be done. And now let's get to you the latest on the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, notification for the election process on 94 seats in the third phase will be released on Friday. Voting in the third phase will be held on the 7th of May. In the third phase, voting will be held for 94 parliamentary constituencies in 12 states and union territories. Starting from today, the last day for filing nomination for the third phase of elections is 19th of April. The seats for which voting is to be held in the third phase includes Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Goa, Gujarat, Jammu and Kashmir and others. Also, there will be a separate notification for the adjourned poll in Madhya Pradesh, Betul. An election season is in, at its peak in India with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. In order to garner support for the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is to hold rallies in Jammu and Kashmir's Udhampur and Rajasthan's Bama and Dosa. With the Lok Sabha elections nearing, political parties are ramping up their efforts to woo the voters with leaders actively engaging with the public to garner support. Senior BJP leader and Union Home Minister Amit Shah will hold rally in Uttar Pradesh's Muradabad, while Defence Minister Rajnath Singh to hold rallies in Uttarakhand's Garhwal and Almora. Uttar Pradesh Chief Minister and Senior BJP Leader Yogi Adityanath is busy campaigning with full vigor. On Friday, the minister will address public rallies in Meerut and Saharanpur to support various BJP candidates for the upcoming general election. 
Also, the opposition parties are going all out to woo the voters. Congress President Malik Arjun Karge will hold election rallies in Kala Buragi and Bidar in his home state, Karnataka, to seek support for its candidates, while Rahul Gandhi will attend a public meeting in Tamil Nadu on Friday. Bhajan Samaj Party leader Mayavati will also campaign in Uttarakhand's Haridwar. Addressing a public rally on Thursday, Mayavati accused Congress of not implementing public welfare schemes during its government before 2014. And as the election preparedness gains momentum, a significant deployment of security personnel in Marwa and Warwan areas of Kishtwar district in Jammu and Kashmir on Thursday, jointly by District Election Office and Indian Air Force. In a unique water awareness initiative, scuba divers in Chennai dove into the sea, enacting the voting process 60 feet underwater. Well, India's first organic state, Sikkim, goes to Lok Sabha and Assembly elections in 2024. What us? The second smallest state in India, along with Meghalaya, which has the wettest spot in India, hold in this 2024 elections. Let us take a closer look. Situated in the eastern Himalayas, the northeast Indian state of Sikkim is known for its scenic locations, Buddhist monasteries and biodiversity. Spread over an area of 7,000 square kilometers, Sikkim shares India's international borders with Nepal, Bhutan and Tibet. It also houses the majestic Kanchenjunga, the world's third highest peak. Tourists from all over India flock to the state's capital, Gangtok, which is a famous hill station. In 1950, Sikkim became a protectorate of India. It became an Indian state in 1975. In the 2024 general election, Sikkim, which has one Lok Sabha or lower house seat in the Indian parliament, will go to polls in a single phase on April 19th. Notably, the general elections and the elections to Sikkim's 32-seat state assembly are being held simultaneously. Sikkim has over 0.4 million voters, out of which 0.2 million are men, 0.2 million are women, while five belong to the third gender. The state is currently governed by the Sikkim Krantikari Morcha in an alliance with the Bharatiya Janata Party. Other parties in the fray include the Sikkim Democratic Front. In the 2019 general elections, Sikkim's lone Lok Sabha seat was backed by the SKM. Observers are closely monitoring the polls in Sikkim due to its position as a strategic border state. Election Desk, TD India. Meanwhile, the Indian Army conducted a training exercise of anti-tank guided missile firing at a super high altitude area in Sikkim. Missile firing detachments from mechanized and infantry units of the entire Eastern Command participated in the training exercise. The training exercise encompassed comprehensive continuity training and live firing from different platforms on moving as well as static targets depicting battlefield conditions. And India and Uzbekistan exhibits their combat power and dominance in the joint military exercise. The fifth edition of joint military exercise, Das Tlik, between India and Uzbekistan, to be conducted at Tarmez district, Uzbekistan. The joint exercise stage is a platform where the two armies hands to share and learn tactics. The 15 days exercise primarily aims at exchanging operational knowledge while enhancing interoperability between the armies of the two nations.
Well, after a long wait of around three decades, an Indian movie would play at the upcoming 77th Cannes Film Festival. Writer-director Payal Kabadia's All We Imagine as Light will premiere in the competition section. Kabadia had previously won the Golden Eye Award for Best Documentary at the 2021 Cannes Film Festival for her documentary A Night of Knowing Nothing. A joint production of India and France, the movie will be competing against Iranian filmmaker Ali Abbas Basis, The Apprentice, Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis and Yorgos Lanthimos's King of Kindness. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. BRS leader K. Kavita brought to Delhi's Rouse Avenue court for hearing in connection with the money laundering case. CBI told the court that Kavita had an important role to play in ensuring kickbacks amounting to over 100 crore rupees to Aam Admi Party. The agency, which took her into its custody on Thursday, demanded five-day remand. She is already under judicial custody in a money laundering case being probed by the Enforcement Directorate. Acting on the Calcutta High Court's order, the CBI on Thursday created a dedicated email ID, Sandesh Kali at cbi.gov.in, for people to register complaints of crimes against women and land grabbing in Sandesh Kali in North 24, Parganas district of West Bengal. The court on Wednesday ordered a court monitored CBI probe into the alleged incidents. The court also directed the district magistrate of North 24, Parganas, to give adequate publicity of the email ID. Indian Air Force saves its army personnel's hand who severed while operating machinery at a forward unit location in Ladakh. IAF's special aircraft was launched within an hour to move the personnel at the r and hospital in India's Delhi where he received medical attention promptly. India celebrates fourth day of Navratri. The temples recited prayers to Goddess Durga while a large number of devotees gathered to offer prayers and take part in the morning prayer to commence the fourth day of the nine-day Hindu festival of Navaratri. District magistrate reached Indian Holy Badrinath Dham Temple and inspected the preparations and construction works of Chardham Yatra to ensure everything is in order for such significant events. Streamlining travel arrangements will certainly help a smooth and safe pilgrimage experience for everyone. In India's Punch, devotees participated in the occasion of the 325th year celebrations of Khalsa Panch Sirgana Divas, also known as Baisakhi. The history of Baisakhi goes back to the celebration in 1699 when Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Guru, called his fellow men for a gathering to infuse courage among them to stand against tyranny and oppression. And still to come on DD India News. Now. Seventh round of negotiations for the India Peru trade agreement took place in New Delhi. In tennis, Indian women's tennis team beat Chinese Taipei 2 1 in its third Billy Jean King Cup 2024 Group 1 town on Thursday. We'll tell you more ahead. And we'll show you unique visuals of celebrations by players and supporters marking the victory of Copa del Rey title after 1984. India that invents. India that innovates. India that excites. India that invites. Land of possibility. Teeming with opportunities. 
Watch India Ideas each Thursday 8 p.m. only on DD India. Welcome back. You're watching DD India News. I'm Lipakshi Kurana and on to some business news now. The seventh round of negotiations for the India-Peru trade agreement took place in New Delhi, India from April 8th to April 11th. The discussions involved understanding priorities and concerns of each other and ensuring that the negotiations are rooted in mutual respect and benefit. In this round of negotiations, discussions encompassed across the chapters which included trade in goods, trade in services, movement of natural persons, rules of origin, technical barriers to trade and others. Around 60 delegates together from both sides participated in the negotiations. In the last two decades, the trade between India and Peru has increased from 66 million US dollars in 2003 to around 3.68 billion US dollars in 2023. The trade agreement under negotiations shall play a pivotal role in future collaboration in various sectors, creating avenues for mutual benefit and advancement. The next round expected in June 2024 to ensure that outstanding issues are resolved before the two parties meet again. Well, the yen struggled to break away from a 34-year low on Friday and was headed for a weekly decline while the dollar hovered near a five-month high alongside U.S. Treasury yields as traders heavily scaled back bets for a slew of U.S. rate cuts this year. The euro was eyeing its sharpest weekly fall in about four months, pressured in part by a resurgent greenback and expectations that the European Central Bank could begin easing rates in June likely ahead of the Federal Reserve. The U.S. stocks ended on Thursday's trading day higher, powered by momentum stocks in the technology sector. New economic data renewed expectations that inflation is still on the decline. The S&P 500 gained 0.74%, while the Nasdaq Composite gained 1.68%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell by 0.01%. Well, the European Central Bank kept the interest rates unchanged after its regular rate setting meeting in Frankfurt on Thursday. The three key interest rates are still hovering at historically high levels of above 4%. It is the fifth time in a row that the ECB has left interest rates unchanged since last October. The Governing Council of the ECB considers that the key ECB interest rates are at levels that are making a substantial contribution to the ongoing disinflation process. NFTX's San Bank Ming Fried has appealed his conviction and 25 year sentence for fraud. Bankman is facing the prospect of spending much of his adult life behind bars for stealing $8 billion from customers of the now bankrupt FTX cryptocurrency exchange he founded. The appeal, however, could take years. And you're watching DD India News Hour. Time now for some sports news. The Indian women's tennis team beat Chinese Taipei 2 1 in its third Billy Jean King Cup 2024 Asia Oceania Group 1 tie in Changsha, China on Thursday. Rutuja Bhosale won the singles rubber, while the duo of Prathna Thombare and Ankita Raina prevailed in the doubles contest. India has currently placed third in Pool A, following two wins and a loss in three outings. Meanwhile, China and South Korea first and second after winning all their th three matches. So far, the top two teams in the six team Asia Oceania Group 1 competition will win promotion to the playoffs, while the bottom two teams will be relegated to Group 2 in 2025. India will next take on Korea on Saturday. 
And in IPL, Lucknow Super Giants will take on Delhi Capitals on Friday in March 26th of the Indian Premier League 2024 in Lucknow. Lucknow Super Giants have made a flying start to the IPL 2024 campaign, winning three out of their first four matches. Their only loss came in the season opener. In stark contrast, the Delhi Capitals are languishing at the bottom of the points table. They have won just one out of their five matches so far. Delhi will rely heavily on their opening duo of David Warner and Prithvi Shaw to provide a solid start. Tristan Stubbs' explosive batting has been a bright spot, but the team will also need support now from their bowlers. Meanwhile, Mumbai Indians defeated Royal Challengers Bangalore by seven wickets in IPL 2024 on Thursday. Mumbai Indians won the toss and skipper Hardik Pandya opted to bowl first. Bangalore managed to reach to 196 for eight despite just with Bumrah's five-wicket haul. While Faf Du Plessis made 69 of 40 balls, Rajat Patidar hit 50 of 26 balls. Towards the end of Bangalore's batting, Dinesh Karthik made a 23-ball unbeaten 53-run cameo to take R. RCB to a competitive total. However, Mumbai Indians chasing came out stronger with Ishan Kishan blasting 69 of 34 and Surya Kumar Yadav scoring 52 of just 19 deliveries. Mumbai overwhelmed the target in 15 over and 3 balls. And moving on, Liverpool slumped to a shock 3-0 home defeat by Atalanta in the first leg of Europa League quarter-finals on Thursday. Gian Lucia's Kamaka struck twice for the Italian side. Atalanta took the lead at Liverpool after 38 minutes when an unmarked Skamaka latched on to David Zapacosta's cross to strike a low shot. Smekwaka stroke past keeper Kahumin Kehela, who should have done more to keep the effort out. The 25-year-old pounced on poor Liverpool, defending to fire home from a fine cross by Charles de Catalaire in the 60th minute. Maro Pasalik sealed the route seven minutes from time with a simple finish off a rebound from Kelleher. Atalanta coach Gian Pero Gasparini praised his team's achievement. An achievement like this deserves to be celebrated. We have to see ourselves in the next stage. We don't want anything else. We'll have to be very focused and attentive to repeat tonight's game, mainly because of what a rival like Liverpool imposes. We are very happy for how big our rival is, a rival that doesn't usually lose. So tonight is also a win for Italian football. Not too many Italian teams have trumps here at infield in their histories. We realize how important it is for our football, for international rankings and also for Atlanta's history. Well, Janik Sinner, Holger Rune and Kasper Ruud advanced to the Monte Carlo Masters quarterfinals on Thursday. Italian world number two, Janik Sinner, East Pass German, Jan Lennart Straff, 6 for 6 2. Meanwhile, eighth seed Kasper Rudd of Norway got the better of Polish 10th seed Herbert Herkax by the same score line. Olga Rune secured a tight 7-6, 3-6, 7-6 victory against Bulgarian veteran and ninth seed Grigor Dimitrov. Rune will next face Sinna for a place in the semis, while 14th seeded Frenchman Hugo Humbert beat lucky loser Lorenzo Sonega in a late finish. And Kenya's Eliud Kipchoge said in an interview on Thursday that expects to make history with his third consecutive Olympic marathon gold medal at this year's Games in Paris. The 39-year-old also said that there are no thoughts about retirement yet. Ethiopia's Abede Bikela, East Germany's Waldemar Sierapinski and Kipchoge are the only athletes to have won two Olympic gold medals in the marathon when they retained their titles. Athletics Kenya named its marathon shortlist for Paris last week. It included Kipchoge, Benson Kipruto and Timothy Kiplagat. Kipchoge appreciated the step by World Athletics President Sebastian Coe to award gold medalists $50,000, each saying it's a good idea for young generations that makes sport more interesting. My huge expectation actually is to win Olympics for the third time. And you know make a street to be the best human being to win for the third time. I don't run because of money. But I run to for because I want to perform. Then the, the other things will come later. 
but uh, it was a great idea for for Sebco and 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 and, and, atle and all athletics circle to come with the idea of popular to go the the methods from Olympic games. Well, star javelin thrower Neera Chopra praised World Athletics' decision to award $50,000 to all gold medalists in the Paris Olympic Games. Speaking during an online interaction, Chopra emphasized the importance of financial support for athletes, highlighting the role it plays in sustaining their careers and ensuring their families' well-being. Sport key to athletics may मनी वाइज इतना ज्यादा नहीं है जितना मतलब बाकी अदर स्पोर्ट में आप टेनिस में फुटबॉल में या क्रिकेट में बाकी स्पोर्ट में देखोगे शायद से एथलेटिक्स में उसके हिसाब से उतना नहीं है लेकिन फिर भी बहुत अच्छा लगता है कि हाँ यार कुछ मिल रहा है क्योंकि पूरा साल मेहनत करते हैं कुछ तो होना चाहिए सभी इन द एंड सभी वही सोचते हैं कि यार हम मेहनत कर रहे हैं हम हमारी फैमिली को खुश रख सकें और जो भी है लाइफ अच्छी चले कुछ हमको अच्छा लगता है हम खरीद सकें अच्छे से रह सकें अच्छा पहन सके कुछ एक आधे शौक पूरे कर सके तो वही है थोड़ा वो तो वो चीज हो जाती है और काफी हेल्प मिलती है और उसके बाद थोड़ी एक फैमिली की जो स्टेबल होने की टेंशन है वो कम हो जाती है क्योंकि हाँ वही है पैसा भी जरूरी होता है लाइफ में आगे जीने के लिए well thousands of supporters crowds the banks of the river navion as athletic bibao players celebrated after winning their 24th copa del rey the athletic supporters take to the streets in celebration after athletic bibao beat mallorca on penalties last saturday marking the victory after 1984 All right that's all for this edition of DD India News Hour but let us know your thoughts on the news of the day you can connect with us at Facebook X formerly known as Twitter and Instagram we'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India I'm Lipak Shikrana from all of us here in Delhi thanks for watching DD India News Hour